Um, I've just finished doing the radio spot on the Pat Kenny Show here on News Talk. Now I'm going to answer some of the questions that you've sent in to us um, and if, that we didn't get a chance to answer on air. And if you have any more questions about your pets, please type them into the comment section below and I'll do my very best to get to them if I possibly can. Now we have about 15 minutes, so I'll, I'll motor on as fast as I, I can do that. Okay? So, first one, here we are. Yeah. So, hi Pete, I have a cat and he eats very well, the usual cat pouches and tinned food. Can I ask, can I feed our cat leftovers from our meals or is that not recommended? I, I, I think, first of all, you don't need to feed a, an animal leftovers because all commercial pet food is complete, it gives them everything they need, fine. But then again, I know that animals like leftovers and people like to feel that they're, you know, they're not being wasteful, so they're using the, the leftovers effectively. So the rule of thumb I would suggest is you try to limit what your cat has to around 10% of the total diet as leftovers. And if you do that, you're going to give the, the cat some tasty treats, but at the same time, you're not going to disrupt the, the balance, the nutritional balance of the diet. Um, the only time we really see big issues would be if, if people start to feed um, a lot of an unbalanced diet. An example would be if you discovered your cat liked eating liver and you ended up giving them lots of liver every day. And if you did that, let's say you're giving them half their food as liver now. If you did that, they'd end up with a very serious illness indeed because of the excessive vitamin A in their body and that would distort their bones and you get all sorts of trouble. So as long as you're sensible about it and keep it to around 10% of the total, no problem. Okay, so um, what's the best way to deal with our five-month-old Bernese shepherd pup? It keeps biting us. We've heard so many different suggestions. The best advice is to get professional professional guidance on this. Um, that type of dog is going to be huge, um, really big, and because of that, it's going to be really dangerous. So if 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 you had a I don't know like a Chihuahua or a Pomeranian that was that was a bit snappy, you could live with that, and you could you know you you, you could manage the situation. But if you've got a dog that's going to be forty or fifty kilograms, uh, and, and it's biting, that's not that's not tenable um so you, you need to nip this in the bud it's really important that you nip it in the bud now you know i don't want to frighten you because it, there's, there's no doubt that puppies um they use their mouths to explore the world they haven't got hands uh, and thumbs and fingers to, to pick things up and they use their mouths and so they extend that sometimes to using their mouths on people as well and one of the things that mother dogs teach their puppies is so-called bite inhibition and that means that the puppy learns not to bite and learns, you know, like a gentle bit of mouthing is acceptable. Clamping down is not acceptable. And dogs are very good at teaching each other that. Um, as a novice dog owner, you probably are not really aware of how you should engage with the dog to make sure that, that happens effectively. And that's why you need to speak to somebody who's got, first of all, training and secondly, experience at, at showing people like you how to stop your dog from doing this. Um, I'm not even going to give you any hints because it's just too dangerous. You need to get this done professionally. Um, you know, uh, you have to build that into the cost of having this dog is um, an investment in behavioral training to make sure that he's a safe animal. Um, look, it's a common issue. Puppy biting is a common issue. And it's like I say, it's not something I'd worry about on Julie, except to say to you that it's critically important that you get this sorted. Okay. Okay, so this comes in from Helen. So how do I stop my dog digging holes in the garden? You can't. Okay. Dogs that like to dig, like to dig. So if you want to stop him from doing that, you have to fence off the garden so he can't get at it. Or what you need to do is to sacrifice a small part of your garden and say, that, my dear dog, is your digging area and encourage the dog to dig there. You might, for example, bury some treats or something uh, and um, give the dog lots of praise when the dog digs there. And that way your dog will, lose up, will use up his digging enthusiasm on a bit of the garden that you don't worry about. But, you know, dogs, especially small dogs like terriers, the word terre is in the name, T-E-R-R, -R, which is French for earth. They are designed, they've been bred to dig, so they're going to do it. Whatever you do, okay? Okay, so my new puppy is 10 weeks old and won't leave our elderly cat alone. She growls and barks at her. Um, they're separated until we finish house training, but what else can I do? Uh, you've got to be fair to the cat. Um, most cats are 
able and strong enough to fend off the playful behaviour of puppies. But an elderly cat probably is just a bit too slow and, and tired and weak to be able to do that effectively. And so they could end up having a tormented life um, from, from this new arrival. So what I'd suggest you do is get a, a, a dog crate. Um, which is a metal wire cage uh, that you put your dog's bed into and put some of their toys in there in a bowl of water. And that becomes your dog's private bedroom. And what you do then when you're not around to supervise things, your dog goes into their dog crate. And most dogs actually quite enjoy that. It becomes part of their life. It's, It's just like their little safe space. And it's safe not only for the puppy, so the puppy won't be bothered by other people, But also it's very safe for the cat because the cat then won't be bothered by this marauding dog. The other thing I might suggest to you is it could be worth getting a cat tree. What a cat tree is, is it's a multiple level uh, sort of platforms and scratching posts and so on. They can go up nearly as high as the ceiling sometimes. And um, if you get a a cat tree, um, that means there'll be perching places on it that your cat can go up to and look down on the dog. And that would make your cat very happy indeed because you'd be out of reach of this little tyke. Okay, so the last question is from David. So I have a pug. She walks regularly on the grass. When she walks on tarmac, she often gets a sore paw and licks until the pad gets swollen. Is there any way to get her more used to the harder road surfaces? Um, It's probably aggravated by the summer heat. Sometimes that can affect dog's feet. Uh, I, I guess it's like ourselves, really, familiarity. So spending, you know, gradually increasing the amount of time walking on tarmac through the winter is probably going to help a bit. But it may be your dog has a particular poor problem. It's quite common to get irritated feet for for various reasons in in different breeds. So it's something you might want to talk to your vet about. The other thing is, of course, you can get little boots for your dog. Um, And, you know, if this is genuinely that your dog's getting sore feet because of repeated contact with the tarmac, then getting getting little sort of shoe-type boots that you put around each foot is something to think about. Uh, Why not? Okay, have we got another one there? Okay. I mean, no, yeah. So Siobhan asks, how do I get my dog to give me back when we play fetch? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of annoying when you throw a ball and, and, and they just hang on to it, isn't it? You want them to come back and give it to you so you can throw it again. Well, th- this, is, this is just basic classic dog training where you have to get the dog to do the right thing one time and you reward them and they... S- if you repeat that, then they'll gradually learn that, yeah, if they bring the ball right back to you, they get a reward. And then they're going to do it again and again and again. Um, um, and I suppose, how, how do you do that? Well, um, often it kind of happens instinctively because dogs just like the ball to be thrown. And so they bring it back to you because they know that if you get it, you're going to throw it again. Um, but the kind of thing you'd have to do normally would be that you would, if your dog doesn't bring it back, you just ignore them and, and, and you don't throw it again. I um, mean, you don't chase them because if you start to chase them to get, try and get the ball back, he'll think this is a great game as well. And that's not going to work for you. So what you want to do is just to kind of spend a lot of time waiting until he eventually does drop the ball close to you. And then you tell him he's a good boy and you throw it for him. And he'll soon begin to make the connection that if he drops the ball close to you, then you throw it for him and he'll love that. And usually that works. Okay, so um, we bought a bird, a mini, I don't know if I'm saying this right, macaw, is that it? Yeah, macaw. And we're making no progress with getting him to fly to our fingers or anything like that. Uh, We think he's a a mini bird and we feel really sorry for him in his cage, but we're afraid to let him out in case we traumatise him. Is there any way to train him? Well, there is, yes. Um, and I, but again, this is an area where I would definitely defer to somebody who has experience of such a bird. Um, exotic pets of all kinds are very tempting to get because they are exotic and you know quite magnificent creatures. But sadly, they're often very much neglected, often accidentally, because people don't really understand their needs. So whatever bird, if, if I was getting a bird, even before I got the bird, the first thing I'd do would be to... to to Google care of that particular species and find out all about it, the precise species, find out where it lives in the wild and what's recommended to give it the best possible life. Um, You know, is it best kept on its own? Is it best kept with with, with other um, birds in a small group? Um, And and I would try to find somebody who's kept these birds before and I would talk to them. Don't try and reinvent the wheel yourself. It's quite complex, this stuff, but it's really important to do it right. Um, and, you know, um, if you put the investment in just now into finding out this sort of stuff, 
uh, you're going to train the young bird much better and you're going to have a much better lifetime experience with, 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 a, with a poo-wee thing. All right. Okay, so this is the last question. Now it's from Neil. So how can I stop my lop rabbit mounting my shih tzu dog? <laughs> I love these queries, kind of random. Your lop rabbit is mounting your shih tzu dog. Okay, well... Basically, hormones are at work here, all right? And um, rabbits, male and female, can, can, can display highly hormone-driven behavior. And that includes mounting behavior and it includes aggression as well. So I would be a very strong advocate of neutering of male rabbits and spaying of female rabbits because that removes the hormones from their bloodstream and it makes them far better behaved in all sorts of different ways. Um, you poor Shih Tzu dog. <laughs> it's kind of terrorizing, isn't it? Having a rabbit jump up on you. So, yeah, call your vet. Get that thing neutered, all right? Or spayed. All right, I think we're finished now. I'm going to leave it at that, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>